Welcome back everyone to week number five. This week we're going to talk about the cheat sheet of quantum computation. So all the gates that are common in building up circuits and then eventually algorithms that you can refer to later on because they'll be used over and over again. First though, I wanted to talk about models of quantum computation beyond this standard circuit model that we've discussed. So we'll touch on some that look quite a bit different than the circuit model, although they're all equivalent in some formal sense. We won't end up using these, but you should be aware of their existence. The first is called adiabatic quantum computation, and it's an analog model of quantum computation, which means it's in continuous time rather than uh, according to these discrete gates that we've been thinking about in previous weeks. The intuition is as follows. If I want to optimize a complicated function, so some function maybe that looks like this, then in one dimension I can almost by eye just pick out where it is if I'm able to draw it, although I'm not always able to just draw these functions if they're difficult to describe. But also in higher dimensions, I may not be able to find that global optimum very easily. In fact, you can take hard problems that aren't initially uh, phrased in terms of optimization and turn them into optimization problems and then try to solve that optimization problem. So that problem is difficult to solve and that this point right here is sort of the, a, a solution to a hard problem that you want to find. The answer to, so that's the solution to the problem, but it's difficult to find. However, if I was given a function like this, well, that's not the solution I'm looking for, but that is easy. To find. So I have the the function that's easy to optimize and the function that's difficult to optimize. What I can do is I can uh, say multiply this function by a and this function over here by by b and slowly increase a and decrease b so that the function I'm optimizing starts at the one on the right and ends up being the one on the left. And there's a theorem kind of comes from physics that if I start here at the bottom and I slowly change this function then I will stay at the bottom. However if I changed it really quickly then I'll kind of bounce around up in here and big jumps might lead me up to some place that I don't want to be. So if I change things slowly, this comes from like thermodynamics, adiabatically, then I can maintain my place at the bottom of the function that's changing continuously in time and end up at the solution I'm looking for. So there's a, a theorem that shows I can transfer you know, problems sprays in one model of quantum computation to problems sprays in another, such as this model, and I can still solve them efficiently. Uh, so this is one. And another one is more difficult to uh, describe. Well, maybe not difficult to describe, but um, more difficult to explain the details. Uh, it, it's in some sense easy to describe, although often these descriptions aren't very useful in understanding exactly what's going on. But imagine we have a whole bunch of qubits, and rather than starting in this canonical zero computational basis state, they start in a state that is highly entangled, so all of the qubits are in a large entangled 
state. So here's my picture of entanglement. Colorful, magical, mystical. Anyway, you can write down a specific entangled state that is such that all of these, these qubits are correlated and that is a, a resource state. So the action of computation is something quite simple. It's just single qubit measurements and the measurements themselves, which ones you do, depend on the results of uh, previous measurements. Um, so I maybe I do this um, in a way that's not all that useful because if you want to go and look at this, typically what happens is um, you imagine that the computation starts on the left hand side and kind of proceeds to the right as you perform these measurements. And so what happens is I, I send some message to the first qubit that says uh, kind of measure uh, in this particular basis and the result of that measurement gets sent back to the computer. The computer does a small computation and then sends a message to the next uh, qubit. That one is maybe performed in the same basis or maybe another basis and the result of that measurement is sent back and uh, by going back and forth then eventually you can get to the end where these measurements uh, at the very end uh, tell you the answer that you're looking for. The computation, in some sense, proceeds through uh, of results of measurements as you move along um, and uh, I should have wrote down at the top but I'll write down at the bottom. This is called um, the one-way model or more descriptively the measurement based model. Uh, measurement based quantum computation it's called okay uh, what the actual computation that happens on the computer is a bit more com mo too complicated uh, not really within the scope of of these lectures but just be aware that that model exists and then the one that we're used to is the circuit model where I have qubits they're arranged in some way and in discrete steps, I perform unitaries um, one at a time, or if they commute, and I can perform them kind of at the same time. And I have sometimes funny little symbols for special uh, gates, and then at the end, I perform a measurement and that's typically assumed to be in the computational basis. Okay, so this is the circuit-based model of quantum computation. And this is by far the most common model and the one that we've used so far and the one that we'll continue to use in this subject. But you should be aware that there are other models of quantum computation uh, more beyond what, I, what I've shown here, but you might say that these three are the most common and the circuit-based model is, is certainly uh, the most common one that you'll see.